Chapter Five of the Gold Sickle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gold Sickle by Eugene Sue, translated by Daniel De Leon. The Story of Sayomara. The storm of questions had spent itself, and the thirst for fresh stories returned among the assembled family of Joel whose head remarked with wonderment what a thing traveling is how much one learns but we must not lag behind our guest story for story proud gallic woman for proud gallic woman friend guest ask mam margaret to tell you the beautiful story and deed of one of her own female ancestors which happened about a hundred and thirty years ago when our fathers went as far as asia to found a new gaul because you must know that few other countries on earth that their souls have not trod upon After your wife's story answered the stranger and seeing that you wish to speak of our own ancestors I shall also speak of them and by Ritha Gar, Never would the time be fitter while we're here telling stories You do not seem to know what is going on elsewhere in the land You do not know that perhaps at this very moment Why do you interrupt yourself asked Joel? wondering at the suddenness with which his guest broke off in the middle of the sentence what is going on while we're here telling stories what better can we do at the corner of our hearth during an autumn evening instead of answering joel the stranger respectfully said to ma'am margaret i shall listen to the story of joel's wife it is a very short and simple story answered margaret plying her distaff the story is as simple as the action of my ancestral grandmother her name was Sayomara and in honor of her said Gilhern breaking in upon his mother and proudly pointing the stranger to an eight-year-old child of surprising beauty in honor of our ancestral grandmother Sayomara who was as beautiful as she was brave I have given her name to this little girl of mine This is indeed a most charming child remarked the stranger struck by the lovely face of little Sayomara I am sure she will have her grandmother's valor in the same degree that she is endowed with her beauty Henry the child's mother blushed with joy at these words and said smiling to ma'am Margaret I dare not blame Gilhern for having interrupted you it brought on the pretty compliment The compliment is as sweet to me as to you my daughter answered ma'am Margaret saying which she began her story My grandmother's name was Sayomara. She was the daughter of Ronan her father had taken her into lower Languedoc whither his traffic called him the Gauls of the neighborhood were just preparing for the expedition to the east their chief Oriagon by name saw my grandmother was fascinated by her beauty won her love and married her Sayomara departed with her husband on the expedition to the east at first they triumphed afterwards the Romans who were ever jealous of the Gallic possessions attacked our fathers in one of the battles Sayamara who led thereto both by duty and love accompanied Oriagon her husband to battle in a war chariot was separated from her husband during the fray Taken prisoner and placed under the guard of a Roman officer who was a miser and a libertine The Roman who was captivated by the beauty of Sayamara attempted to seduce her But she repelled his advances with contempt he then surprised his captive during her sleep and outraged her Listen Joel cried the stranger indignantly listen to that a Roman subjects an ancestor of your wife to such indignity Listen to the end of the story friend guest said Joel you will see that Sayomara is the peer of the Gallic woman of the Rhine The one and the other Margaret proceeded Showing themselves true to the maxim that there are three kinds of chastity among the women of Gaul the first when a father says in the presence of his daughter that he grants her hand to him whom she loves the second when for the first time she enters her husband's bed and the third when she appears the next morning before other men the roman had outraged Sayamara, his prisoner his passion being satisfied he offered her freedom upon payment of a ransom she accepted the offer and induced the roman to send her servant a prisoner like herself to the camp of the Gauls and tell Oriagon or in his absence any of his friends to bring the ransom to an appointed place 
the servant departed to the camp of the Gauls. The miserly Roman, wishing himself to receive the ransom and not share it with anyone else, led Syomara alone to the appointed place. The friends of Oriogon were there with the gold for the ransom. While the Roman was counting the gold, Syomara addressed the Gauls in their own tongue and ordered them to kill the infamous man. Her orders were executed on the spot. Syomara then cut off his head, placed it in a fold of her dress, and returned to the camp of her people. Oriogon, who had himself been also taken prisoner and managed to escape, arrived in camp at the same time as his wife. At the sight of her husband, Syomara dropped the head of the Roman at his feet and addressed Oriogon, saying, That is the head of a man who outraged me. There is none but you who can say that he possessed me. At the close of her narrative, Ma'am Margaret continued to spin in silence. Did I not tell you, friend, said Joel, that Syomara, Margaret's grandmother, was the peer of your Gallic woman of the Rhine? And must not the noble name bring good luck to my daughter? added Gilhern, tenderly kissing the blonde head of the child. That powerful and chaste story is worthy of the lips that told it, said the stranger. It also proves that the Romans, our implacable enemies, have not changed. Avaricious and debauched were they once, and they are today, and seeing that we're speaking of the avaricious and debauched Romans, and that you love stories, he added with a bitter smile, you must know that I have been in Rome, and that I saw Julius Caesar, the most famous of the Roman generals, as also the most avaricious and most debauched man of all Italy. I would not venture to speak of his infamous acts of libertinage before women and young girls. Oh, did you see that famous Julius Caesar? What kind of a looking man is he? asked Joel with great inquisitiveness. The stranger looked at the Bren as if greatly surprised at the question, and answered with an effort to suppress his anger. Caesar is nearing old age. He is tall of stature, his face is lean and long, his complexion pale, his eyes black, his head bald. Seeing the man combines in his person all the vices of the worst women of the Romans, he is possessed like them of extraordinary personal vanity accordingly in order to conceal his baldness he ever carries a chaplet of gold leaves on his head is your inquisitiveness satisfied joel would you want more details about caesar's infirmities that he is subject to epileptic fits that but the stranger did not finish his sentence letting his eyes wander over the assembled family of the bren he cried with towering rage by the anger of Hesus, can it be that all of you, as many as you are here, capable of seizing the saber and the sword, but insatiable after idle stories? Can it be that you do not know that a Roman army, after having invaded under the command of Caesar one half of our provinces, has taken winter quarters in the country of Orleans, of Touraine, and that of Anjou? Yes, yes, we've heard about it, calmly said Joel. People from Anjou, who come here to buy beef and pork, told us about it. And it is with such unconcern that you speak of the Roman invasion of Gaul, cried the traveller. Never have the Briton Gauls been invaded by strangers, proudly answered the Bren of the tribe of Karnak. We shall remain spotless of the taint. We are independent of the Gauls of Piotr, of Touraine, of Orleans, and of the other sections of the land, just as they are independent of us. They have not asked for our help. We are not so constituted as to offer ourselves to their chiefs and to fight under them. Let every one guard his own honor and his own province. The Romans are in Touraine, but it is a long way from Touraine to here. So that if the pirates of the north were to kill your son Albinic, the sailor, and his brave wife Miro, it would nowise concern you because the murder was committed far from here? You are joking. My son is my son. The Gauls of provinces other than mine are not my sons. Are they not, like yourself, the sons of the same god, as the druid religion teaches you? If that is so, are not all the Gauls your brothers? And does not the subjugation, does not the blood of a brother cry for vengeance? Are you unconcerned because the enemy is not at the very gates of your own homestead? On that principle, the hand, even when it knows that the foot is gangrened, could say to itself, As to me, I am well and the foot is far from my hand, I need not worry over the disease. And the gangrene, not being stopped, rises from the foot to the other members until the whole body perishes. 
unless the healthy land takes an axe said the bren and cuts off the foot from which the evil proceeds and what becomes of the body that is thus mutilated joel put in ma'am margaret who all the while had been listening in silence when the best regions of the country shall have been invaded by the stranger what will then become of the rest of gaul thus mutilated and dismembered how will she defend herself against her enemies the worthy spouse of my host speaks wisely said the traveller respectfully to ma'am margaret like all gallic matrons she holds her place at the public council as well as at her heart you speak truly rejoined joel margaret has a brave heart and a wise head often her opinion is better than mine i gladly say so but this time i am right whatever may happen to the rest of gaul never will the romans set foot in our old brittany there are her rocks her marshes her woods her sandbanks above all her bretons to defend her at these words of her husband ma'am margaret shook her head disapprovingly all the men of the family however loudly applauded their bren's words End of chapter 5